Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another program in the series Community Camera, brought to you by the Learning Resources Center of Corning Community College. The fifth in our series of visiting lecturers is with us today. Very happy to welcome to the program Gay Talese. Gay, welcome to the program. Very nice to be here, Walter. I have had a very illuminating few days on the campus and um, have been particularly impressed with the variety of reactions to what it is that I'm doing. The uniqueness of this campus, of course, to an outsider like myself, is that you have among the student body an age representation. Some students of the same age that you would find on most campuses and some older mm -hmm. students. That's and that's becoming increasing. It's true. very interesting to have it that way. Mr. Talese, as I'm sure many of you know, is, a, is an author of uh, several bestsellers. You began it more as a, did you begin as a journalist? Yes, uh, I did. I began, I've only really had one full-time job, uh, which lasted 10 years and was on the New York Times. I, I joined the Times three years out of college. I went to the University of Alabama. And, uh, but many years before going to college, I had an idea that I wanted to work for a newspaper. That was the generation, I think, when, since I'm speaking of the 1940s, when I was in my adolescent stage, I think the newspaper business provided a sense of glamour traveling, the idea of the trench-coated foreign correspondent was a, was a familiar figure, and there were films about that kind of man. That's almost an American folk hero, <clears throat> in a way. No longer, though. But this, I would think I was the last generation that would think of newspaper men as being romantic figures, because later on, television uh -huh. co-opted it. The, the, the stars became the television commentator, or the, the network star, the David Brinkley, or the Walter Cronkite. I think there's a great difference between television uh, <coughs> reporting. And one of the differences that worries me a little bit is that I think television uh, is less critically absorbed by even the intelligent viewer. When you read something, you have to take those symbols and, and, and put them into a meaningful pattern on your own. There's a more active involvement. Television just pumps it in and you sit there and and you move along at the pace uh, of the presentation, and it, it's a more passive thing. Certainly, when you when you watch television for for news, if you watch the seven or eight six o'clock net network news, you only really get the headlines. Television cannot give, even to the very interested viewer of television, uh, what a newspaper can give in terms of detail. There simply isn't the time and the cost of, of, of the television minute is, is, is an uh, astonishing figure, as you know. Is the newspaper reader, uh, <clears throat> has it become a, an elite group? Uh, most people really don't read the full columns in mm. the... Well, you know, you're really not supposed to. I mean, most people who read a metropolitan newspaper will read it for a variety of reasons. Amazingly, uh, a high percentage will not read it for the news at all. They may read it for the for the job wanted, uh, or or the apartments to let column, or or simply to uh, peruse the sports page. I mean, you know, all these features in a newspaper: the the, the home section, the, the economic section, the stock reporting, uh, the local news, the weather. Uh, all in the New York Times, they even have a column. The arrival of ships. I mean, you know, they have people. Yeah. If you would uh, uh, remove the classified advertising, uh, um, it would it would it would certainly reduce the circulation of the New York Times. Just the classified advertising, where you can find what say, what jobs are available and the cost of an apartment. And significantly, if you are a historian and you're going to go back into the history of America, let us say in the year 1910, arbitrarily and you go to the microfilm of your library, and you look up the New York Times in some particular date in 1910, you will find America revealed more tellingly in the classified advertising or the display advertising. You will see what a Ford, what a fur coat cost, and, and the price of an apartment, and, and what jobs were available, and, and, uh, or applications on, on the part of people wanting certain jobs 
than if you looked at the news. If you looked at the front page, the headlines of that, any particular day of the New York Times on, as to what was going on in national foreign affairs, you, you wouldn't get a sense of the way people lived. And you look at the advertising, historians have certainly found this true. It's much more interesting. It's beguiling to do that. I've, many times I've gone to those microfilms on some kind of research project or other and, and got into the uh, ad sections and wild away some mm -hmm. precious hours. Uh, what, uh, when you were, uh, when did your book come out on the, on the Power and the Clark? That was in 1969. The, uh, the first book I, I wrote was A Young Man's Look at New York. It was called New York, A Serendipitous Journey. Just a s sort of a... Was that originally a series of n no. articles? Or well, yes, yeah, some of them did appear in the New York Times, but it was really the, the, the side street view of New York. It was about the, the little people that survive in a big town and are never made, and never made the newspapers. Very few of them did. Then I wrote a book on uh, construction of a bridge. I was interested in high steel work. And I watched a bridge <coughs> that, of course, is still there, the biggest uh, suspension bridge in the world. It's called the Verrazano yeah, Narrows Bridge. Yeah, it connects Brooklyn and, and Staten Island. And that was, uh, they started to construct that bridge around 1959, 60, 61, and I was hanging around on the edge of the water there. And then as they started to put the steel up and build the cables across, and, and the workmen, you know, these, these steel workers that operate from three to 500 feet in the air in the wind and linking steel across the, the waterway, I would go up with them and watch how they did it and watch how they balance themselves. Sometimes you're on that very uh, shaky catwalk. It's like being in a circus and you're, and you're working to connect links of steel or maybe a cable. And the wind is blowing at, at a certain, uh, certain level of velocity and then it stops and you know, you're tilting and compensating and then you have to readjust. It's really good. People always but die on bridges. I've never been over that. I've sailed under it going yeah, out of the harbor. Beautiful bridge. But, uh, beautiful never, bridge. And the man who, who, who engineered that bridge, an old Swiss gentleman, he did, in fact, most of the bridges that are, have been built in New York in the last 75 years. O.H. Amon is his name. That bridge that I speak of, the Verrazano Narrows, was so, such an expansive enterprise that he had to take into account when he did the engineering of the two towers and the extremities of the bridge. He had to take into to account the curvature of the Earth. Mm -hmm. You know, the Earth was actually That's different at one side. And it's, the, uh, the next book I did was, um, uh, was on the New York Times called The Kingdom of the Power. That book was my first best-selling book. Kingdom of the Power, and right. Then, uh, and then the um, <laughs> next book was <laughs> called <laughs> Honor Thy Father, which was about a mafia family. And the book I'm now doing and close to completing, which I've been doing since late 1971, this book does not have a title yet. The word, it's about sex in America, but I don't know what we're going to call it. Sex in America might be a good title. No. But we'll, we'll, it's not bad. It's the last thing we'll On do. On the Times, before we leave that topic, uh, Gay, uh, it seems to me that the, the Times, precisely because some of those elements you mentioned, like ship sailings and who knows what, is still a wonderful melange of, of many different things, and you can, you can go through it and find a lot of fascinating things, and it has good world coverage. But it doesn't seem to have uh, as, I, I think the general uh, literary style has slipped. And I don't see many newspapers anymore that seem to cultivate a, uh, a, a prose or journalistic prose style. I, I thought the old Herald Tribune was well written in a sense that You're it had a certain right. polish. I wanted to work for the Herald Tribune. When I first came to New York in uh, 1953 and 4, I uh, tried without success to join the staff of the Tribune for the very reasons you cited. It was a well written newspaper. However, the Tribune's coverage of the city and of the nation and of the world very limited. Those few people who were on the staff of the Tribune were were writers more than reporters, or some of them were a combination of both. Whereas the Times was, was and, and is interested in reporting. It is not interested in prose stylists, although it has some good writers. One of them, um, named Francis Kleins, writes a very interesting column about New York. And of course, Russell Baker is a very witty and, and uh, first class writer who I, I understand has a big Broadway play coming into New York this year. But by and large, uh, I agree with you, the, the old Tribune had fine writers. 
And the old afternoon papers in New York, which are now long gone, the World Telegram and the Journal American had some very good feature writers. Some of them wound up in the New Yorker magazine. Mm -hmm. What outside of New York City, uh, what uh, papers that have some claim to be more than just uh, local papers, what ones do you uh, respect the most? Well, I, th I think the, the Washington Post, certainly, of course, everybody's aware of that because of the big movie on the Watergate, a story of Woodward and Bernstein. The Washington Post is a, is a very fine newspaper, and not only because of the political coverage, because there's some writing. Sally Quinn is one of the very interesting feature writers, but there's several others. The Los Angeles Times, uh, while it's a very bulky paper, having an enormous amount of advertising, and it's almost like a, a three-pound package every day, uh, is a very powerful and very good paper. The San Francisco papers, uh, while the, the Chronicle has a, the entertaining column, always interesting column of Herb Cain, uh, it, 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 isn't, it isn't probably as strong a paper as it was long ago. The, uh, in the South, I, I went to school, as I said, in Alabama. The Atlanta Constitution is a good paper. There, you know, there are good papers all through the country. Well, Some the, the Chicago Tribune seen. is a, a I don't see it, uh, certainly. Uh, I see occasionally something taken from it, but I have some Midwestern friends who say the St. Louis Post-Dispatch mm, for is years, a, yes. a very good paper. Yes, yes, and the Kansas City Star. The, uh, the young men, though, who, uh, who are now in, in their 20s, and are in journalism class or journalism school, I think have been, um, their interest in journalism has been revived. Um, this almost goes against what I said earlier about television having co-opted the, the star process that used to be when I was young in the newspaper business, but I think the success of Woodward and Bernstein as reporters and the, and the, and the Robert Redford um, role uh, and, and Dustin Hoffman that was in that picture uh, ma ma made many young men reinterested in becoming investigative reporters. And that certainly is a, a noble calling because so few of, of us who are just average citizens who pay our taxes and we always think too much and perhaps nearly always are right, uh, have no idea how government is operating. The government is not going to tell us how they're operating. It'll tell us what they want us to know. And we really do need, in the area of uh, reporting aggressiveness and in industriousness, cynical or certainly always skeptical views of the way political life is, because political life is so frequently corrupt, and the ta taxpayers are so frequently fleeced by it. And there is no one to tell us. Now, occasionally, you will we'll, we'll have a leak that will lead to a Watergate expose, and then we'll, all right, we, have an, we, we know. But the Johnson administration, the John F. Kennedy administration, the Roosevelt, Truman, could have had the same Watergates going on. It just happen, we happen to know about, about Nixon. Yeah, I believe you're right. And, and the reporters in the Johnson time or the Kennedy time, I think Kennedy had a way of wooing the press, and he got away with That's a lot. That's the only thing, though, that worries me a little bit. I agree completely with what you're saying, especially the fact that, well, it's a necessary counterbalance, and uh, without it, I think we'd be in bad shape. But I, I'm, I'm worried sometimes about a, a selective application. Now, you mentioned Kennedy, and I think his relations with the press were good, and Nixon's were certainly bad, and Nixon probably got what he deserved out of it all. But, but but if you look at the Kennedy administration, and we have some information about the illegal wiretaps. Oh, that it's excessive. General, I mean, the Attorney General Robert Kennedy did, and that who was uh, canonized uh, uh, by the liberal uh, press, and it's an, it's 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 possibly to, to a degree the, because of the un, you know the most sad experience of of those assassinations in the '60s, not only to Robert Kennedy but to Martin Luther King and to John Kennedy five years before. But uh, in the case of John Kennedy, he wasn't really president long enough. He was essentially president for two and a half years. And during that time, there was a lot of pizzazz and glamour. And he used television very well. Mm -hmm. uh, Nixon Certainly. didn't have no. that kind of talent. And I think Lyndon Johnson, I think Lyndon Johnson was a marvelous president. 
Lyndon Johnson was, was mocked uh, by most mm. of the newspapers, and he didn't come across on television worth a darn. I mean, that was the problem mainly with Johnson. He couldn't communicate to the public. He was a good president, a That's good man. you would uh, agree with uh, the, the, your predecessor, uh, Ben Wattenberg. Uh, Did he say that? Yeah. He oh, I didn't know, have any some high marks to the Johnson. I think his, history will treat Johnson with, with proper respect, uh, and history will treat John Kennedy with a little more disenchantment than, than, than we have been accustomed to reading, because most of the historians who dealt with Kennedy years were, were Kennedy appointees. It's hard to write objective history if you're part of an administration. I, mm. I felt that I think uh, Schlesinger's done some great writing, but when he writes about the Kennedy years, That's right. he's, he's obviously he's in uh, stars in his and, eyes. Yeah, yes, he's writing about his friends from Harvard. He's writing about his, his friends. I mean, mm. I would write about my friends the same way. I don't mean that I would do any better. I'd be lucky to do as well. But the thing is not to write about your friends, <laughs> yes. How did you get into the, uh, the uh, Honor Thy Father uh, book, Gay? Well, in the last year uh, on the New York Times, I covered all kinds of stories. And there was a great emphasis on organized crime and, and how it was operating and what to do about it. And I went to some of these court trials. And, and one day in a courtroom, while it was be during a recess, actually, I saw uh, a young man about my own age who was standing with his lawyer and he was just about to have to go in and testify. Someone said, "That's you know that is that's that's Joe Banana's son. Joe Bananas is the popular term for Joe Banano, but Joe Banano being a big mafia lord. That in uh, Buffalo. Was well, but he had connections in Buffalo and centered New York, but he's supposed to have connections from Buffalo to Canada, including uh, even out to the uh, Arizona, where, where Joe Banano still alive, still lives." And the, but the son uh, intrigued me because the son had gone to college and had gone out in the, in, to live, in fact, in Arizona and went to, to the University of Arizona for a few years. And here was a college-educated uh, junior member of the mafia. And I thought, that's interesting. You know, you, they send, you send your kids to college for many things. You send them to Harvard Business School. You send them to, to be college to become geologists or, or English professors or, or television producers or whatever you But here's a mafia guy that sends his kid to college really to learn something about life, but really the whole idea was to bring him back into the family business, and the family business being, being the mafia, and I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, uh, did this person who was in the mafia, who was my age, keep in touch with his colleagues from the fraternity house, and, he, and, and did he go to football games and cheer on the University of Arizona football, or basketball, or baseball team, and you know, what was his life like, and what is it like now that he's in the mafia? He was about 33, 35 at the time that I first saw him. So the curiosity on my part was there and was alive and prompted me to go to the lawyer during this recess and ask if I could someday have lunch or dinner. It took me a year, constant calling the lawyer. And finally the lawyer says, all right, we'll just have dinner. And the lawyer was there. That was in 1966. It wasn't until 1969 that I was really able to spend time with that person during that three-year interim. A lot had happened. The mafia family, the Bonanno family, was feuding with another mafia family in the New York City area. And the, the differences, and, and a couple of heads were blown off in the process, were resolved, much like Sadat and, and, and uh, Begin will resolve differences, we think, in, in, in the, as a result of the signing and, and hopefully what will happen in the future. But these mafia wars are in microcosm like the larger wars between nations a China-Russia rift, or Arab-Israeli traditional problems, well, these, or United States versus whoever. These mafia families are like little, they're like, like little provinces, little duchies, fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. And That's they have their, 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 their lord, their little mafia chieftain, and he's got his lower level of royalty, and underneath the other soldiers, the spear carriers. And, and they these guys are fighting in the streets of the cities, and, and the larger world's going on, worrying about the economy, and, and Vietnam, and China, and blah, blah. And these people who are in the mafia wars have no interest in the New York Times' coverage from Pakistan and what Mr. Khomeini is doing. They're worried about what Joe Monogatz is doing over here. And they have their own, <laughs> yeah, their own war. Their own foreign policy right. and their own uh, Sure, and they have sons that go to college for a while. And I wrote a book about this guy. Yes, it's, uh, here on the table. I, I noticed the end pieces that you've got uh, uh, a family tree of the bananas here. Yeah, that's, that's like, that precedes uh, the roots by, by Alex Haley. I mean, the, <laughs> 
It, it wasn't exactly Kunta Kinte. It was, it was Joe Bananas and, 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 and family. There. Is that part of the public's fascination with the Mafia? And I think it's safe to say there is a fascination. We've had a number of movies and, and novels uh, lately. It, it, I think I think part of it, and I, I wonder if you agree, is the fascination in a time where uh, families are breaking yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely. That was the interesting in relationship. Roots. The interested in roots uh, and, and, and the mafia and the Godfather. The movie, The Godfather, you saw with Marlon Brando and Al Pacino and the rest of those people. Jimmy, Con, James Con. People love that picture. And, and granted, there's a lot of violence and shooting and people getting bulleted out of cars and all that. Uh, but there was a strength in family and tradition and, and caring about one another. Most of the American uh, families have lost the capacity to care deeply. And, uh, and that's one thing I think that America has, has a longing for, to care with intensity. And, and occasionally, you know, most of the murders in this country that the government, state, federal, m municipal cannot do a thing about are crimes of passion. Most of the murders, the homicides, are done with people who are practically related. That's what's so particularly interesting about the mafia. I mean, these people are shooting one another because there's a violation of trust, because they're so deeply involved. Yeah, that's uh, the point. Not that I that's, was that's the solution, I would su suggest. Trust or, or, or loyalty, even if in society's view it's a kind of perverse loyalty, uh, that is something that I think people still do respect, though, and it's the yeah, thing that That's they, the old America. Uh, that's that the way they, this country was system. really started. I mean, yeah. they really had such a commitment, and when we broke, you know, really had a, well, there's a small town, which you have, I guess, still in the regions such as where we are now, which you certainly lose if you go to Chicago or Los Angeles or New York or Philadelphia. You forget it. You are, then you're, and you're in, a, in a kind of cell. And there's an ambivalence about uh, crime. Uh, on the one hand, there's the law, there's a strong law and order uh, philosophy that generally prevails and uh, people are worried about crime, but the colorful criminal, the Billy the Kid or, or the... Mm -hmm. or the anti-hero. Uh, yeah, will we'll draw a sure. kind of... A we have a man in called. New York, I don't know if he made the newspapers up here, but about a month and a half ago, well, there's a problem of double parking in New York with all those cars and all those diplomats who just park where they want to, and it's, it's impossible to drive in the streets because someone's practically parking, if not on the sidewalk, it's certainly yeah. triple yeah. park. It's a mess. So they have the system of these tow trucks, hundreds of tow trucks in New York, where they go rigging up these cars and they chain them to the fender and they haul them away. And in hauling them away, they add to additional traffic jams. One man who was hauled away, young, vigorous man, not only was hauled away, but his car was damaged in the process, which is most often what happens. It's very hard to tow a car across town, and New York has the bumpiest streets in the world, with the exception of maybe Te uh, Tehran. And the um, car was damaged, and this man, when he goes all the way across town, pays a $75 fine, sees the wreckage to his car in addition to the fine, being infuriated by the whole process, decided to get revenge on the towing business. <laughs> he sneaks in that night with a machete, and he chops up the tires of all the towing trucks that were parked by the very do by dozens of them that night, just resting like like elephants at a circus between acts. And this guy, with his particular axe, was chopping these tires up. Well, that got in the papers the next day, and of course, he became a hero. This man was doing to the to the tires of those towway trucks what people in their fantasies wanted to do to the people who drove those trucks. And that man became a hero. The man who climbed the Twin Towers, you might remember a year or so ago, oh. violating a law, became a real hero. We even had heroes of Skyjackers years ago were kind of heroes. Yeah. Until it got to be, got to be more a commonplace, <laughs> <laughs> and they, the novelty went out of it. It's, uh, it's, there is the, the brutal side, of course, uh, that, uh, that doesn't come out in the romantic image. I, I remember uh, on one occasion being at a cocktail party in Buffalo at a friend's house, uh, an attorney up there, and, and having uh, someone pointed out to me that they evidently had reason to know was one of the hit men for uh, one of the local organizations, mm -hmm. which I'm don't remember the connection or wouldn't mention if I did probably but but it was very he was there in a pinstripe blue suit and a nice uh, conservative tie and a white shirt and uh, seeking respectability being very respectable mm -hmm. and uh, and yet it was you know it was said so matter-of-factly and it seems hard to believe it happens and yet we know it does I understand that the 
pattern is not to, uh, the, the person doesn't take assignments of that sort in the area where he lives, but he's apt to do it in some other part. He cares about a better neighborhood. He's yeah. a good, good citizen in that sense, a good community resident. But the uh, other fact is that these middlemen, these, these hoods, mafia figures or whatever, Billy the Kid, these people in society perform an illegal service. It is a service that people want. Gambling, while it's been more liberalized in recent years, and we have in New York OTB and, and lotteries going on in most of the, in many of the states. For the longest time in the 1950s and 60s, that was all illegal and was all part of a mafia or, or organized crime cartel. But people like gambling. People um, wanted in the 1930s and 20s to drink. The government produces this ridiculous thing called prohibition. And so they, the whole underworld gets into the business as for 23 years it dominated the business of illegal alcohol. And sometimes the government should be more responsive to what is a crime and what is not a crime. The crime that, I, that I'm currently in this book dealing with, the one I haven't finished yet, is pornography. And like illegal li liquor in the 1920s to 30s, um, and drugs throughout the 50s into the, through the whole 60s, marijuana and, and, and other forms of higher octane druggery. The um, pornography is a source of, of great underworld com um, of interest because the government sometimes makes the mistake, I think, of putting its um, taking, taking options and assuming a prerogative over the privacy of people's lives. I, uh, I do not want to see government control. I'm not a hunter, for example, but I don't want gun control because it's another way of government controlling people. I don't want government to tell me what kind of books I can read. I don't want government to tell me I can't look at dirty pictures, in quote or church leaders in government, which are so, so often in collusion, do not want that kind of regulation. I certainly want safety in the streets. I don't want to be mugged. I don't want my house broken into. I don't want my daughter raped. I don't want that. I, don't, I want garbage picked up. I do want services and expect to pay for these services and, 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 and do, do not at all mind high taxation if the services are rendered properly and efficiently. But I don't want too much government. I'm conservative in that sense. I don't want Mr. 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 Federal Government to go peeping into my bedroom or tell me what I cannot see in a motion picture theater uh, or, or tell me whether or not I can drink. And, and so time, we have too much government sometimes. Well, I think that's that? an increasing feeling. And I think that's one of the areas where some of the, uh, the new left, what used to be called a new left, maybe that's an old term already, and the old conservatives agree on, I think, some uh, of, of that kind of uh, attitude toward government. I'm looking forward to that, uh, your new book, whatever title you choose. I'm sorry we won't have more time to, to discuss that today, but I thank Welcome you. Welcome back and talk about it. I wish you would. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Our guest today has been Gay Talese. Uh, author and uh, visiting scholar in the Corning Community College Visiting Scholar Program. This has been Walter Smith with Community Camera. Thank you for looking in. This is Consultation. When I got involved in this relationship,